today we are going to be focused mainly on cybersecurity questions and that'll come after we finish doing the questions of the day found in the community tab over here on the YouTube channel. So again, those of you who are new, I do networking, productivity, study tips, cybersecurity content on this channel, mainly networking and study tips because networking is my favorite topic and um, cyber and study tips. Study tips are very important because it doesn't matter how well you know the material if you're not optimizing for other things such as sleep, exercise, diet, things of that nature, then you are more than likely going to set yourself up for failure on the exam. A lot of people don't consider sleep, exercise, and diet a part of studying, but I do, and it's helped me to pass all of my certification exams on my first try, right? So let's get into it. Question of the day number one. I posted this about 12 hours ago, kind of late, but we still got 59 votes in. <clears throat> Which operating system operates in the cloud? So let's see what people voted for. 7% said Windows, 14% said Linux, 76% said Chrome OS, 3% said Android. So the answer here is Chrome OS. Chrome OS operates in the cloud, which is why when you get a Chromebook, it's very lightweight with regard to the specifications and the resources on the hardware because everything is essentially virtualized in the cloud, right? And you can, and, and it's pre pretty much, you're just using a, a Chrome browser essentially. And everything is just, I, I would say streamed from a cloud, right? So that's basically um, that with regard to the operating systems. And oh, see, I was just talking about this. If you wanna do better on your exams, consider exercise as part of your study plan. Aerobic exercise a few hours after learning influenced hippocampal processing during memory retrieval and improved associative memory. This is something that I found to be super useful when I was studying for my exams. I made sure that I integrated exercise within my study, study schedule and my study plan, right? And I got this from Neurohacker on Instagram. And if you don't believe me, let's look at this study real quick. I know you're here for the practice questions, but I want you to actually integrate healthy habits into your study plan so that you can maximize your chances of passing each exam that you do. So let's just look at the first line of the abstract. Exercise induces beneficial responses in the brain, which is accompanied by an increase in BDNF, a trophic, a trophic factor associated with cognitive improvement and alleviation of depression and anxiety. So BDNF stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor. And it essentially helps you to learn better. When I was studying for the CCNA, what I did was put on Jeremy's IT lab videos on my iPad and my bike has an iPad holder and I used to just ride the bike and watch his videos and it helped me a lot and I ended up passing the CCNA on my first try, right? So I would say don't even take my word for it, just try it out for yourself and see how you feel. And also, exercise helps you to feel better. You you release endorphins when you're exercising and you have, you know, a better mood and it can help you learn better, right? So, next question. What is a type 1 hypervisor also known as? So, a type 1 hypervisor is essentially or any type of hypervisor is essentially a virtualization tool, 
right? It allows for you to set up multiple operating systems on your system and you can allocate a specific amount of memory, CPU and storage to each of those virtual machines, right? So 52% of you said bare metal, 5% of you said hosted, 6% of you said console, 29% of you said VM manager, and 9% of you said none of the above. So the answer I was looking for was bare metal. So when whenever you hear type one hypervisor or whenever you get a question about type one hypervisor, or you hear it out in the world somewhere, you are specifically referring to uh, bare metal or a native hypervisor, if you will. And a type one hypervisor is typically used in data centers where you have servers and you don't necessarily need to install like a Windows or whatever, a Linux or a Mac operating system on any one of those things. You can have multiple operating systems on those servers. You just install the type one hypervisor on the bare metal, which means that you're installing it straight onto the system as its own operating system. And then you can install multiple other virtualization instances on top of that, right? I believe there's some Cisco equipment. I think it's called the um, Unified Computing System. Let me look that up real quick because I don't want to botch that. Unified Computing System. Yeah, that's a Cisco server. So a Cisco Unified Computing System, which is a data center server product line composed of server hardware, virtualization support, switching fabric, and management software. So that's a real world instance with regard to how a type one hypervisor is used, right? So here's that. Um, let me mute this. I hope the sound is coming through good. I muted the desktop just now because I don't want, yeah, hopefully the sound was good. So the next question, which of the following is a piece of software that serves as an intermediary between the operating system and specific hardware? So let's go back to see the votes. So 13% of you said device manager, 2% of you said download manager, 79% of you said driver, 3% of you said bash, and 3% of you said none of the above. So the answer is driver. And one of the typical cases of drivers that you should think of is when you have a printer that you're trying to install. I think printers still use drivers. I really don't mess with printers that much anymore, but I know at least back in the day, printers needed drivers in order for, or I would say that computers needed drivers in order to work with printers, right? And that's for any hardware. It could be, you know, I have a capture card here somewhere. And once I plug that in, it installs drivers. It asks me if I want to install drivers so that my computer understands what the hardware is trying to say, or it helps facilitate communication between the computer and the peripheral device, right? Mainly think about printers when you're referring to drivers, because that's something that the A plus loves to emphasize printers and you're probably gonna be working with a lot of printers when you get to a help desk position, right? If that's what you are essentially going for, right? So driver's what we're looking for. This was a fun question, more on the networking side. Which of the following IP addresses would be valid for a web server out on the internet? So, Keyword here, out on the internet. And you've probably seen in a few of my videos by now, um, those of you who are new, you probably haven't seen it. 
but I like to emphasize networking a lot and I talk about IP addressing a lot as well, right? So the key here is to differentiate between request for comments 1918 private IP address blocks and public IP addresses, right? So 7% of you said 10 point 10 dot, I said point, 10 dot seven dot nine dot one, even though there's probably nothing wrong with saying point, but I just had a brain fart there. Um, 43% of you said 192.168.2.67. 19% of you said 172.16.31.6. 6% of you said 192.0.1.7 and 14% of you said 10.255.254.8. 14% of you said that one, right? Guess what? Only 6% of you got that correct. Out of these 69 votes, only 6% of you got that correct. The ad the address we're looking for is 192.0.1.7 because that is a public IP address. And if it's out on the internet and hosts on the internet need to get in contact with it, it needs to have a public facing IP address. It needs to have an accessible IP address. And private IP addresses are not accessible from the outside of the network in of themselves. They're gonna need network address translation or well, we're gonna need some sort of NAT situation going on where you can have hosts from out on the internet being able to communicate with hosts on an inside network at an organization which is represented by a public IP address, a public IP address. A web server is probably, mm, I would say it's typically in a DMZ of an organization. DMZ stands for Demilitarized Zone. That's another A plus terminology that you should get familiar with with regard to firewall zoning. And that allows for clients to get in contact with resources they need to access, but in a sort of safe zone, right? The off limit zones are the inside zone for the the, the organization's personnel, which, is, which contain private resources and other zones that are stipulated by the IT administrators. And again, typically the DMZ is used for more public facing resources that people can access. I would say an example of this is a, maybe another example is DN, a DNS server or Google server, right? 8.8.8.8, that's a public IP address. And we can ping that IP address, we can get in contact with it, we can get resources. Um, that's the Google server, right? So now, these are the IP addresses here, right? These three and these, those all fall within request for comments 1918. So let's pull request for comments 19. 18 up real quick so that we can just pretty much take a, a look at it. So request for comments 1918. It's the class A IP address block of the all of the 10 network. Class B is 172.16.0.0 to 172.31.255.255. Class C is 192.168.0.0 to 192.168.255.255. I believe I incorrectly said that the range or the CIDR mask for class C was slash 24. It's actually class, it's actually slash 16, right? So um, yeah, there's that. And for class B, it'd be the range would be represented or can be represented by slash 12 and the 10 network can also be represented by a slash eight. So there's that. Make sure that I pull back up these. Okay, cool. 
and let's see yeah we did this one last week so that's it for the community tabs questions we are now going to go into some of the cybersecurity questions that I wrote up just now, right? So let's pull this over here. Let's make it widescreen. And maybe I can make the font a little bit bigger. Don't want to destroy the formatting though, but yeah, you know what? That should be good enough. We just have to scroll down. Okay, that looks good. I think that looks good. Yup, that looks good. So, these are the CompTIA A plus cybersecurity practice questions that I wrote up just now. So, which of the following is considered something you are? So, some of you may know what this question is referring to, but this question is testing your knowledge on AAA, right? Um, which is authentication, authorization, and accounting, right? Authentication is what we're specifically testing our knowledge on right now. Authentication has multiple factors, right? It has um, something you are, something you know, and something you have, right? So which of the following is considered something you are? Something you are is your fingerprint, right? So your fingerprint is considered something you are because it's something that's unique to you and you only. It's essentially asking you, when it asks you which of the following is considered something you are, it's asking you about biometric data. Biometric data is data that is unique to each one of us, right? So. When we're opening our iPhones, we can use our, do a face scan. Um, in some more advanced um, situations, you might have an iris scan, palm scan. We use fingerprints to open our iPhones. That is something that we are, that's something that we are, right? I gotta, I gotta fix the formatting here. I save these files just in case maybe one day I can just email it to you guys or what have you. I have to set up a, I don't know. I might just set up a, a mailing list where you guys can get these practice questions. Might do that this weekend. If you're interested, let me know in the comment section. Greggy Bear Four, thanks for dropping in. What area of tech are you trying to break into? So I am currently trying to break into the network engineering space. Um, I would like to start off with help desk if I can, work my way into the knock and then eventually work my way up into uh, network engineering. So my, I would say my five year plan is to become a network engineer. So thank you for the question. Thank you for dropping in, I appreciate you. Um, but currently right now I'm doing some um, A, plus, a plus practice questions because um, I think it's still solid for review, solid to know a lot of the basics and the foundation. And um, so I'm currently located in Connecticut. So um, I've been, you know, working on getting into that, getting into that space over here over here on the East Coast in CT. So, yes sir. Next question, which of the following ports are used with TACAX Plus? So, TACAX Plus is a Cisco proprietary AAA server um, solution that's used with Cisco devices and it uses TCP port 49. Sometimes I get mixed up with um, TCP port 69, which is TFTP, but TACAX Plus uses TCP port 49. And the benefit of using TACAX Plus um, as opposed to RADIUS, which is uh, industry standard protocol, is that 
it encrypts the whole payload between the communication of in the communications of the devices right so yeah there's that that's something that you're probably more than likely going to learn on the um while you're studying for the a plus and something you're going to get tested on and again this is like basic cybersecurity networking stuff right three is which of the following is a form of social engineering that targets high profile individuals is it spear fishing whaling tailgating shoulder surfing so the answer here is going to be whaling so whaling targets high profile individuals such as ceos managers supervisors etc right spear phishing is similar in the sense that it's more broad a broad targeting where it's targeting multiple people at a corporation company or something along those lines right greggy bear nice i'm critical infrastructure lead for uw madison and infrastructure at security lead for flux a crypto project if you ever need help with resume review or general help always welcome always feel welcome to ping me oh okay i got you so um do you have a a linkedin i can uh hit you up on linkedin or um i'm not really too versed on the twitch platform yet i don't know if it has like a dming feature but i'll definitely follow you and um yeah if you have a linkedin you could just maybe you might not feel comfortable with dropping it in the chat but i'll see if i can reach out to you some way somehow thank you very much uw madison and infrastructure that's dope that's cool how long have you been doing that and it's funny because i just updated my resume <laughs> so yeah i just um did a, a resume just updated my resume yesterday so that's funny enough um I kind of like try to since i don't have any like i would say uh formal formal it experience in a professional role i kind of put some of the labs that i do with regard to like cisco and um videos that i've done on youtube and stuff like that in my resume and i linked it into the resume that way so yeah awesome Thank you for dropping by again. Number four, how does an attacker gain access to an access layer switch despite port security measures in place? Is it IP address spoofing, MAC address spoofing, URL spoofing, email address spoofing? So the answer we're looking for here is MAC address spoofing. So you can have port security in place and despite having port security in place, an attacker can use some spoofing tools to get around that. And this is why I think that it's essential to use like DHCP snooping and dynamic ARP inspection because it'll prevent propagation of further attacks like rogue DHCPs and stuff like that, right? well don't get discouraged by that my director's last job before it was a bouncer at a bar <laughs> that's cool i think that i think that what it boils down to is and this is what i've heard on multiple interviews and from different areas in the it space is that um it's about soft skills right so i would assume that as a bouncer you have solid soft skills right and especially solid understanding of human psychology and i think that's a great position to be in with regard to um working with people because that's what it essentially is it's, well at least at the help desk level ticketing systems and stuff like that is essentially working with people having good customer service skills so yeah before i started you know venturing into it i was a union steward and um for six years and that was a great experience with regard to getting a lot of people skills experience in and 
yeah, it, it was definitely a lot. So that's pretty much it for the cybersecurity practice questions. 